couple of days ago, closing November, we talked about Easterlin's paradox that growing incomes do not improve happiness at the aggregate level over time or when compared between countries. We also explored some alternative schools of thought with the zero growth steady state economics. And we have talked about circular economy, but I forgot to mention how you can bring circular economy into your kitchen by using your coffee grounds to grow oyster mushrooms. And I forgot to mention that the pandemic recession should not be confused with the planned economic contraction that is advocated by the degrowth movement. That is, degrowth refers to a reduced material consumption accompanied by redistributive policies that reduce inequality. One of this week's readings continued on this post-growth theme. Otero et al. call for zero growth scenarios to be included in international policy documents on biodiversity conservation. On page 10, they give the following motivation. Scenario development within international biodiversity policy thus explores a broader range of institutional and economic reforms that could accomplish ambitious biodiversity and well-being targets. By acting as laboratories of new policies, they help to ease the resistance of vested interest against such a transition. New policies include resource caps, resource sanctuaries, limits to large infrastructure, redistributive green taxation, work reduction schemes, agroecological development, compact urban planning and restrictions to advertising. Elsewhere, Otero et al. elaborate on resource sanctuaries that they refer to moratoria on resource extraction in biodiverse regions. Otero et al. call attention to the global map of roadless areas by Ibish et al. from 2016 to help guide where to protect biodiversity. Otero et al. also describe that alien species are the second most common threat associated with extinction. And for this reason, I decided to include the recent warning by scientists on the topic. Let us start with some definitions. From Pisek et al, page three, alien species, as opposed to native species, are those whose presence in a region is attributable to human actions, deliberately or inadvertent that enabled them to overcome biogeographical barriers. And another definition classifies as invasive only those species that have a harmful effect on the economy, environment or health. So, for example, Pablo Escobar's hippos do count for alien species, but as they have a benign effect on the ecosystem, they do not count as invasive whereas some innocent looking worms do qualify for the invasive status. This map enclosed in Pisek et al. shows which regions have the highest shares of alien species. Calculated as the number of established aliens relative to the species richness in that relevant taxonomic group and subsequently averaged. The paper also included a table of the most notorious invasive aliens in terms of number of extinctions attributed to, to their name. In general, Pisek et al. mentioned that invasive predators are more likely to lead to extinctions than alien competitors. Note that the common house cat also made it to the list, so why not have your cat wear a bell if you let them wander outside? Pisek et al. described how the problem of invasive alien species is already a priority in Australia and New Zealand. And let's, let us watch a TED talk by Vincent Florence about invasive alien species on Mauritius, where he also speaks of the power of education for conservation.